Andre Bowden Schwartz is one of the cinematographers behind Pose. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Andre. And to start, can you just tell us about the process of filming the ballroom scenes and just showcasing each person as they're walking and posing and dancing and just making sure that it doesn't feel too repetitive with the camera work? Sure. I mean, um, I think, you know, filming the ballroom scenes for Pose is something that we all, uh, you know, look forward to very much, but also part of us, you know, dreads because there's so much there because there is so much that's unknown about how each one is going to unfold. Um, and they're also the most technically challenging things that we that we do, you know, on the season and per episode because there are so many people um you know doing so many very unique performances you you kind of never know how it's going to go but you do know that it's going to be challenging um with you know so many extras and and lots of equipment and three cameras um but the thing is that i don't think there's it, in in a way it's very hard to be repetitive because we you know we have a certain list of um sort of back pocket uh camera positions and moves that work well for the space and you know certain sort of conventions that we that we like to play with um that kind of provide a, a jumping off point to each ball scene but actually you know even though there's kind of a formula of walking down the middle and you know billy up on the stage it actually you know beyond that um each person who's walking and and each uh storyline delivers something so unique that it's actually very difficult to repeat yourself and we we tend to go in and watch you know we watch the ballroom scenes being rehearsed before we shoot anything and honestly before you even have a chance to really plan you have to you really have to watch the rehearsals and try and sort of take in and appreciate what the performers are giving you and uh you know try and synth synthesize that with the technical knowledge of the space uh that you already have mm -hmm. and um you know in the ballrooms it often takes us you know a few takes before we really find the, the tone and the pace and the feeling of the ball and then we start to kind of uh improvise and experiment from there so um you know, it's it's tense and it's exciting, and ultimately, you know, it's as good as it's as good as the show gets because we all have so much fun collaborating with each other. Totally, yeah, and I mean the the lighting in the ballroom I think is also really extraordinary with just how it complements the actors so well. I mean, especially Billy Porter. How much work do you put into that every episode? um we put a lot of work into the lighting um for the ball scenes in every episode there are i i don't remember the number there are hundreds of units um that are uh for the most part leds installed um not just uh in a grid above this stage that's also all designed to um you know become part of the set as in it's okay if the camera sees it um but there are also lights installed in you know in all of the practical fixtures and the disco balls and under the stage and under the balconies just about anywhere you could possibly imagine having space for something there's a light there ready to be used in a moment's notice and um it's all in an effort to uh, impact the performance as little as possible, but be also able to have the greatest creative flexibility so that once we see the dance and we, especially once we see the costumes and once we know the music, then, um, you know, we can quickly implement uh, new ideas and new strategies and light gags and, um, you know, colors and pulses and anything that feels appropriate, not just to that specific um, ball scene overall, but sometimes that moment within the scene. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we really, I usually come up with a sort of rough plan of how I want it to look and what I feel like is appropriate before we get there and put that in ahead of time doing the broad strokes. But then once we really see all of the costumes and we see what the art department has done um, in their part of the room, uh, I always finesse and tweak the colors and the systems until the very last minute. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, try and let it be as an organic, you know, organic uh, development as, as possible until we lock the look in. Wow. Yeah, well, there's also the house of Evangelista, the apartment they all live in, which is very cramped feeling, especially compared to the ballroom, obviously. How do you just tackle those scenes where the space you're working with is more limited? Uh, oof. I mean, it is a funny thing um, about the show in its dichotomy. I think when I was first approaching the job and first, um, you know, watching Simon Dennis, who was the DP that I took over from, watching him work in the two spaces, I think my gut reaction was, I can't believe that, you know, the show exists in these two such different spaces. But the truth is that once you get your feet wet and you start um, getting into it, there's actually a lot of similarity between um the environments and that's uh, you know that's by design it's not an it's not an accident that um you know these two spaces by you know the way that ryan likes to work and the way that things have to be um you know move seamlessly from one location to the next uh that they they still feel connected when you watch the show and that has to do with you know, all the sets have hard ceilings and they are, you know, recreations of real spaces in New York City to, a, you know, to a vast degree and as accurately as was, you know, practically possible. Um, it means that when we're working in the Evangelista house, you know, the, the room itself that we're inside of is basically like a real apartment. I mean, there's not that much difference. Um, the, the, what we have great control over is the light outside the windows. Of course, it's on stage, so we have control over what's coming through the windows and what color it is and how that works. And we have control over all the practical units inside. But you, you can't get away with big movie lights um, inside Evangelista. There just isn't any space. And so you really have to be creative with the kind of control that we built into the practical world. And when you, you know, sort of expand your mind a little bit, um, it's not that dissimilar to what we're doing in the ballroom because there are so many people from the extras to the performers and there are so many movements that we have to take uh, into account that it's another space where it's really not practical to um, put a lot of large uh, fixtures on the floor. And so we really rely on the practical lights that have been installed in, you know, in the space in anticipation for, uh, you know, whatever might happen. And so the, the system between the two spaces, even though they look so different, is actually very similar. And it's really, you know, conceptually the same approach, even though in one space you're talking about, you know, using one or two lights and in the other space you're talking about using a combination of, you know, 150 units. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating. Um, I, I actually wanted to mention episode four, which is never mm -hmm. do up like this before, which is the big candy episode lots of great uh panning shots in that episode i think that really reflects just the community and just this outpouring of love i mean how did you approach that very special episode of the show well um you know one of the things that made that episode episode four um very special for me was also working with uh brian as the director, because that was the one time that I had him 
as uh, the director on set for season two. And, um, you know, I think that he, he, he works in a very unique way and it was a way that I found um, created a lot of room for, um, you know, a, a, a certain level of uh, creativity and trying um, new ideas. And, you know, that partially has to do with the fact that, um, you know, Ryan is very, he, he has a very specific eye and he's very much able to um, watch blocking or, or, you know, come into a scene and just off the script know exactly which shots that he, that he wants and which ones that he needs um, and is very clear in communicating that. And the result is that it, you know, when you have a very, as a cinematographer, when you have a very clear game plan, it also, um, you know, creates certain opportunities to explore and to, and to play. Because when you know for sure what your, you know, your next 10 shots are or what the A and B cameras have to do for the next five setups, it, it means that if you, have room, you can use the C camera for something that you think of. Or, you know, Ryan can also be very collaborative and, you know, look at the scene and give you the three shots he knows he needs and then look at you and say, and how do you want to do it? Um, and, um, you know, it's, I think that uh, when you have, when you have that level of confidence uh around you and planning the shots it actually can um uh, can lead to a lot more exploration and you know a lot of play because the boundaries of the world and the you know creative environment for that episode are so well defined that you know how to reach for something uh that's going to be successful rather than try this and try that until you you know hit a winner yeah, that was such an extraordinary episode. Um, and well, with this being a season, I think that had a, a lot of real conflict between the characters, a lot of the argument scenes, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it feels like there's there's there was a lot of great escalation of tension and stakes. And I'm just curious how much is thought out on your end through just blocking ahead of time, or if it's just one of those things where the actors are making choices and you're just responding to them kind of instinctively? Um, hmm. I, you know, that's a great question. I think that on this show um, is unique, um, at least in, in the work that I've done, in I think how collaborative it is with the actors and how much we and, you know, my camera operators um, last year, it was uh, Peter and Wilda, how much they are able to react um, and really play and dance with the actors. I mean, a lot of the movies that I do, most of what we want to get is planned out very specifically. And in this show, I think what we really want um, is, is known, you know, I have a lot of feelings and then make a lot of notes as I'm reading each script and obviously, you know, trying my best to keep track of what's happening with all the characters and where we're at in the relationship so that I, I have some kind of concepts to explore about space between the characters in this scene or closeness between characters in this scene or, you know, how they should be interacting and whether it should be a direct eye line or, you know, whether it should be um, a different kind of over where they're more obscured. Um, but... The truth is that the the actors, you know, they they bring so much in a very free kind of movement environment that we also really try hard not to be too specific and not to lock people in. Because I think that it's clear to anybody that works on the show and watches the show that even though it's difficult, that the actors tend to move a little bit differently between takes or you know, their performance, um, you know, evolves throughout the scene, it makes it a little bit harder for us as technicians, but it ultimately makes the show just 
that much better and that much more realistic. And I think it's what part of what makes Pose uh, a successful show is because it doesn't feel too shoehorned by the conventions of, you know, television or or movie coverage. It feels like these people are real people moving through real space, and we want to preserve that as much as we can. So as much as we come, as much as I come to each scene with an idea and kind of desires, it's like writing down a wish list. Like if things go really well, I would like to express these things about the interrelationships between the characters with the camera. And we'll just look for that as we go, rather than trying to, you know, really strictly block people into, um, you know, certain uh, aspects of their performance. Well, I believe this is your first time working on a Ryan Murphy project. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of touched on it a little bit there, but was there anything even more special just about working on one of his shows in this kind of environment just compared to other projects you've done in the past? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, that's that's an easy question. I mean, that's um, uh, this show is unlike anything um that i've worked on in the past and maybe we'll get to work again you know work on again in the future um i've worked on i've been i feel like very privileged to work with a lot of um female directors and with a lot of female uh centric uh stories as well as on a lot of you know lgbtq um uh, material in my career. So it's not necessarily that it's the case that, you know, it was like stepping into this world and my eyes were opened. I don't, I don't want to say that, but it's the first time. And I think it's, it would be the first time for anybody that you work in an environment where the, um, the, you know, the, the people who were depicting on the screen are also the people who, you know, are, are very closely related to the people who are creating the show. And that the characters who show up to the ballrooms are really part of the ballroom culture. And that the whole show and Ryan's entire, you know, sort of creative ideology for the show is that people who know the material, who live the material should be writing the material and should be directing the material. And that's what he was, that environment, I think, is the greatest achievement of the show from my perspective, is putting something together that is, uh, I think, beyond simply just being inclusive, but is sort of takes that to a different level and creates an environment where, um, you know, the characters on the show who sort of live a life that we depict as, um, you know, marginalize and go through great difficulties, actually, you know, live a, a sort of a more, let's say, aspirational narrative. And a lot of that is reflected in the actual storytellers who are behind the creative um, forces that that drive the show. So that the the whole thing from, you know, from top to bottom feels just deeply honest and 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 very unique and like an experience that um, I think everybody who steps onto our set knows is extremely rare and extremely special and extremely valuable and um, you know really has the chance to touch I think deeply all of the people who work on the show from you know people in my position to you know all the way down the list to where you have more people like the the pas and the drivers and just everybody who comes in contact with the show uh even if they're not directly on set all the time with the actors i think could um report uh feeling that kind of privilege to be there mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone I've talked to from Pose, you're you're just you're making something very special, and I think you are kind of leading by example for for the industry as at large. So, thank you for that. 
And um, for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more interviews just like this and head to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. Andre, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you very much.